She blessed us this morning by lifting up her voice in praising the Lord. We're grateful that you're able to join with us here on this Sunday morning. Our scripture this morning is found in the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah. After prayer and meditation, I asked the Lord to give me a word this morning. And there is a word from on high. Here we're living in this time of crisis, COVID-19, and prayerfully the Lord led me to the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah. And we read these words in Jonah chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And so he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Verse 4 reads, Then the Lord said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry? This morning, in the time that we're living in, Jonah, in our scripture today, is angry with God. He's upset with the Lord because of what God is doing for someone else. Jonah is mad with God because God is getting ready to bless someone else. And we're living in a time today where people are bitter, people are angry, but God has a way of putting us all in the same situation. God has a way of bringing all of us under the same umbrella of this crisis. The COVID-19 crisis, it, it does not discriminate. It doesn't care whether you live in an urban area or in a rural area, whether you're rich or poor, whether you live in a mansion or in a, an apartment or cottage. The COVID-19 has brought us to a place where God has put us all in the same situation. And now we're, we're in a time where it's no time for biased thinking. There's no time for prejudice right now and discriminatory actions because we serve a God that is slow to anger and quick to mercy. We serve a God that does not want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come into the knowledge of truth. We serve a God that is no respecter of person. God shows no partiality. To God, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for all are one in Christ. And so this morning, I want to preach from the subject title, We Are All In This Together. We're all in this together. Won't you pray with me? Oh, gracious and merciful Father in heaven, thank you. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to serve you. I'm humbled by this awesome responsibility. And now, Lord, I pray that you use me as a vessel, if you will, and merchandise your word through me and to me and to me as your people. Let your word go forth with boldness and understanding, where your name is magnified and glorified. Your people are edified, and your kingdom is enhanced. This is my prayer. I'm your servant, and you're my God. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are all in this together. In Jonah chapter 4, Jonah chapter 4 begins with Jonah angry with God. Jonah is mad. He is upset with what God has done for someone else. Jonah is having this angry conversation with the Lord. The fourth chapter of this prophetic book starts off with, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly what God did. What God did irritated Jonah. It annoyed Jonah. Jonah was dissatisfied with the Lord God Almighty. Why? You have to understand the history that Jonah had with God. You see, this book of Jonah is four short chapters. And in order to understand why Jonah is so frustrated, 
here in chapter 4, we have to understand the relationship between God and Jonah in chapters 1, 2, and 3. We know that in chapter 1, God called Jonah to tell Jonah to go preach to Nineveh. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. Instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah went down to Joppa and bought a ticket headed for Tarshish. We know that in chapter 1, after running from the Lord and getting aboard a ship, God sent a mighty storm against that ship. We know that the sailors did all they could to right that ship. But when they found out that Jonah was on board, when they tried to do all they could, there was a sailor who went below deck and saw that there was a stowaway passenger on the ship. He reported to the captain saying, we have a passenger who was asleep in the midst of this storm. And when the captain questioned Jonah, who are you? He said, I'm Jonah. He said, where are you from? He said, I'm an Israelite. What do you do for a living? He said, I'm a prophet of God. I'm one of God's servants. And then the captain said, why are you on my ship? And Jonah had to come clean and admit, I'm on the wrong ship going in the wrong direction. And I am the cause of the storm. And after discovering that Jonah was the cause of this problem, the cause of this storm in chapter 1, the record is the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him overboard. And there Jonah is now thrown into the sea of destruction. And just before he could drown, God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah down into the belly. And the great fish went down to the bottom of the sea. And that's chapter 1 of the prophetic book of Jonah. In chapter 2, Jonah prays from inside the belly of this fish. In fact, the entire chapter 2 is Jonah praying out of distress. Jonah, he prays the prayer of distress. He sends God a prayer for SOS. In chapter 2, Jonah prays the prayer of his life. And that's what we are today. We have been thrown overboard. We have been thrown into the sea of sickness. We have been swallowed up in the, in the belly, in the great well of this pandemic. We're in the belly of this virus. And we need to pray from inside this situation. We can't wait until we come out of this to pray. We can't wait until God delivers us and then pray. We, we need to call on God now while we're in this distress. We need to send God a prayerful SOS. We need to pray like Jonah did in chapter 2. We need to pray like Jonah did, saying, Lord, I'm deep in the realm of, uh, of the dead. Help me. Lord, I've been hurled into the depths of the sea. Hear my prayer. The waves are crashing over me, Lord. Save me. We need to pray like Jonah did when Jonah said, You have banished me from your sight. Lord, will I ever see the temple again? Will I ever be able to go to church again? Will I ever be able to go out again? Lord, the waters engulf me. The deep surrounds me. Jonah said, I'm as low as I can go. Seaweed is wrapped around my head. And I'm knocking at the door of Sheol. We need to pray like Jonah did. Because Jonah prayed the prayer of his life. And when you pray like that, God hears that prayer. God heard him, and at the end of chapter 2, God touched the fish and made that fish swim topside. God touched the fish and made that fish spit old Jonah out. And then, there Jonah is standing on the seashore. And in chapter 3, God gives Jonah a second chance and says, will you go now? God says, go to Nineveh, and this time Jonah will God gives Jonah a second chance to do what is right. We need to be like Jonah. When God brings us out of this crisis, when God sees us through, God is going to ask us the same thing. He's going to ask, will you go now? When God brings us and delivers us out of this COVID-19, he's going to ask the same question, will you go now? Now that I have delivered you, will you go to church now? Now that I've saved you, will you go to Sunday school now? Will you read your Bible more now? 
now that I have rescued you, will you worship me now? Will you serve me now? Will you praise me now, now that you've been delivered? Will you give my name praise, honor, and glory that it's so worthy of? That's what we need to do. God is going to ask us the same thing when he brings us out of this. Will you go now? You know, many times God has given us a second chance. In fact, God has given us second chance after second chance after second chance. And the sad testimony is when God brings us out of something, oftentimes we go right back to doing what we were doing before he brought us out. Oftentimes we even beg the Lord, Lord, if you get me out of this, Lord, if you allow me to make it through this situation, Lord, I promise you, I promise I'll serve you, promise I'll go to church. That's what we do. We say, Lord, if you let me pay this bill one more time, Lord, if you let my child get through this situation, Lord, if you help me to make ends meet, I'll go to church, Lord, I'll sing in the choir, I'll join the usher board. That's what we do. We try to bargain with God. Lord, Lord, if you just get me out of this one more time. But as soon as God delivers us, as soon as God brings us out, oh, we may do right for a little while, but then we got pressed right back into our old ways. But God is watching, and God is tired of our mess. God is tired of our junk. He's tired of us being hypocritical and just giving him lip service. God is saying, I'm going to give you one more chance. God is tired of us giving us lip, giving him lip service. And we can learn from Jonah. Because after God gave him a second chance, after realizing what could happen when you disobey God, when Jonah was standing there on the seashore and God said, will you go now? The record is Jonah got up and cleaned himself off and set out for them. Jonah in chapter 3 was so happy that God had delivered him. He was so happy that God had saved him. Jonah took advantage of God's mercy because in chapter 3, verse 3, a trip that should have taken three days by foot to Nineveh, Jonah made it there in one day. That's a breakthrough, church. When God saves you, the Lord, when he rescues you, he wants to see a breakthrough. That's a breakthrough. You see, that's a testimony in action. That's Jonah's testimony in response. And when God brings you out of this, he wants to see your testimony in action. God is tired of us giving him lip service. Jesus described that in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, when he was talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the hypocrites. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and 8, these people draw near me with their mouths they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God wants to see some action. God wants to see your service. And so Jonah in chapter 3, he gets to Nineveh and he preaches to the Ninevites. Jonah teaches the Ninevites that if they don't turn from their sinful ways, in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. Jonah preaches that God will destroy you the way he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Jonah preaches so good that the Ninevites believe, the Ninevites turn from their wicked ways. Jonah preaches so good that the Ninevites proclaim a fast. They humble themselves wearing sackcloth. The nation goes into prayer. Jonah preaches so well that the people all together go into prayer. Even the king Jonah's preaching reaches the king of Nineveh, and the king comes down, he comes down off of his throne, he takes off his crown, he takes off his royal robe and puts on sackcloth and humbles himself by sitting in the dust. That's a symbol of humility. Even the king came down from his throne to pray. God, God will destroy Nineveh is what Jonah said, and the people and the king called for a nationwide fast and a nationwide prayer. The king not only calls for a fast among the people, he proclaims a decree saying, neither man nor beast shall eat or drink anything. And we need to have a nationwide day of prayer and we need to have a nationwide fast because we are in a crisis. And we need to cry out to God 
just like the king told the Ninevites, cry out to the Almighty God. And so Jonah preached to Nineveh. He preached so good that the people prayed. The people fasted in Nineveh. The people turned from their evil doings and they turned back to God. And when God saw this, God relented. When God saw this, he held his hand back from their disaster. God saved them from destruction. And now here in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah, after doing what God told him to do, Jonah is now having this angry conversation with God. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Jonah is saying, this is why I didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. Because I knew that if you sent word by me to Nineveh, you would repent. I knew that after hearing your word, the people would turn around. I knew that, that you would show them mercy. That I knew that if I preached to Nineveh, you would show them your grace. I knew, I know that you are a God that's slow to anger and quick to mercy. I knew that you would relent from punishing them. The message is Jonah wanted them punished. Jonah wanted them destroyed. Jonah did everything God told him to do, and he still harbored hatred in his heart. Don't you know that there are people today who, who harbor hatred even in the midst of this crisis? Here we are all together. We're in this thing all together, but there are people today who are still hating on one another. Just the other day, there was a security guard trying to get someone to wear a mask before entering the store, and instead of just simply putting the mask on, they go and get family members and they kill the security guard. There are people today who are still harboring hatred. Uh, just the other day, there was a young man jogging he was trying to get some fresh air and some exercise, and two men, a father and son, hunted him down like an animal and shot this man with a rifle. There are people today who are still harboring hatred, and we are all in this thing together. Don't you know there are people who even go to church who will have hatred in their heart? There are people who do church work, they serve the church. There are people who even preach that don't want to treat you fairly. We can reflect on that in our history. There were those who attended church back in the day, but they still wanted you to sit in the back of the bus. There were people who called themselves Christians and believers, but they denied you the right to vote. There were, there were so-called believers years ago who enslaved folks, who sold human beings, who discriminated this dual personality among people doing God's work and still harboring hate that's still around today. There are people today who are angry with God for blessing somebody else. They're angry with God for giving someone else a second chance. There are people who believe you don't deserve to be where you are. There are people who are frustrated today. They have resentment towards someone today because God has shown loving kindness to them. That's what Jonah's problem was. In Jonah chapter 4 verse 3 is so upset, he asked God to take his life. He's saying, I'd rather be dead than live and see the Ninevites blessed. There are people today who, who are, are just like Jonah. They don't want to see you enjoy life and enjoy life more abundantly. And in verse 5, in verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and he made a shelter for himself and he sat under it in the shade until he would see what would become of the city. Jonah said, yes, I preached to them like you told me. Yes, I prophesied to them like you told me, but I still want you to destroy them, Lord. Now he's sitting on the outskirts of town looking for the fire to come down from heaven. Jonah is saying, God, do I have to remind you about the Ninevites? God, do I need to remind you how bad Nineveh is? The book of Nahum chapter 3 talks about how bad Nineveh was. In Nahum chapter 3, the Bible says, Woe to you, Nineveh! Woe to the city of blood filled with lies! Woe to you, Nineveh, full of plunder, never without victims, never without the crack of whips and the clattering of wheels! Woe to you, Nineveh! Never without galloping horses and jolting chariots. Never without flashing swords and glittering spears. Woe to you, Nineveh, many casualties 
piles of dead bodies without number in the street, people stumbling over the corpses. Nineveh was a bad place. Nineveh was a horrible place. But you can't be so bad that you fall out of the hand of your God. You can't be so awful that God can't save you. God saves to the uttermost, and Jonah did not want them saved. But God in verse 4 says to Jonah, he says, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? This is the same Jonah who disobeyed God, and God gave him a second chance. This is the same Jonah that God told to go to Nineveh, and he went to Tarsus. This is the same God that God told to go 500 miles east, and Jonah went 2,500 miles west. God says, go preach to, to Nineveh, and Jonah went on a cruise. But God gave him a second chance. How can you enjoy God's mercy? How can you enjoy God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's kindness, and not want the same thing for someone else? God can bless who he wants to bless. God's blessings don't need to meet your approval. You can't try to justify who God should bless and who God should not bless. Who are you, Jonah? to try to question who God blesses? Who are you to ask someone for their birth certificate? Who are you to ask someone for their citizenship paperwork? Who are you to determine whether someone is legitimate or illegitimate? We serve a righteous God. The Bible says in Job 25 and 4, how can man be righteous before God? Jonah is judging who God blesses and who God should not bless. And we still have some Jonas around today. All these Jonas ain't dead. Now how can you tell who Jonah is? How can you know? Because Jonah has been blessed with mercy, but he doesn't want you to receive mercy. How can you tell who Jonah is? Jonah enjoys God's grace, but he doesn't want you to enjoy God's grace. Jonah, he's received God's forgiveness, but he can't forgive. Jonas are bitter. Jonas hold grudges. Jonas have access to crime. That's how you can tell who Jonah is. And Jonah, God has been good to Jonah. But every time you see Jonah, something is always wrong. They're always mad, not always poked out. Bitter, bitter, bitter. That's how you can tell who Jonah is. Listen, Jonah's still around today because God blessed Jonah with a new car. But as soon as you get a new car, Jonah's got a problem. God has blessed Jonah with a house, and, but as soon as you get a house, Jonah, Jonah's been blessed with a position on the job, but as soon as you get a promotion, Jonah has a problem. God had to help Jonah. God showed Jonah that he can bless whoever he wants to bless. And in verse 5, when Jonah went out to the outskirts of the city, waiting to see the city destroyed, it was hot. The sun burned greatly, and God provided a leafy plant, a tall growing tree, so Jonah could sit in its shade. He could have comfort from his anger and be cool in the shade of this tree. And the record is Jonah was happy about that plant. Jonah was pleased with the plant. He enjoyed the shade of that tree. Jonah, the irony is he hated the people, but he loved the plant. And God sent a worm, a worm to eat up that plant. And when the sun rose with its scorching heat and the wind and the hot winds blew, Jonah again said, it's better for me to die than to live without this plant. God said, now you're concerned more about the plant than you are about the people. He says to Jonah, you didn't tend to the plant. You didn't fertilize the plant. You didn't plant the plant. You didn't water the plant. You didn't do anything to make it grow. Now, you have a right to be angry with the plant. God is saying that's the same way you're doing the people. God planted the plant, and God took away the plant. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord allows the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. No one can judge who the Lord chooses to bless. Don't judge is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, judge not that you might not be judged. 
For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and it will be measured back to you. And so why would you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a two by four in your own eye? Jesus is saying, don't judge. The Lord can bless who he wants to bless. And we are all in this together because to God, all souls matter. To God, all of us matter. In, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God made a sacrifice for both of them so one man and one woman could be saved because to God, all of us matter. When Noah built the ark and God told him to make a sacrifice, God made it that one whole family should be saved because we all are in this together. Moses told the children of Israel to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost and the mantle that one nation might be saved because we all are in this together. And one day Jesus was walking by the Jordan River and I heard John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world because to God all souls matter because we're all in this together. I'm so glad that Jesus is not biased. I'm so glad that Jesus does not discriminate, that Jesus is not prejudiced because Jesus told a dying thief one day on the cross that this day you shall be with me in paradise. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, that God desires that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of truth. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men consider slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance, because we're all in this together. We all are sinners saved by grace. That's why God sent Jesus. God so loved the world because we're all in this together. He so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son who came down through 42 generations, got dropped off in Bethlehem of Judea because we're all in this together. I'm so glad that Jesus is not prejudiced. I'm so glad that Jesus is a good servant. He told a Samaritan woman about the living water. Jesus gave a Canaanite woman the living bread. Jesus took a Greek man named Bartimaeus and gave him his sight. Jesus killed a Roman centurion servant because we're all in this together. Jesus healed a woman with the issue of blood. He healed a man way out in Capernaum. Jesus healed a man with a withered hand. He healed ten lepers one day. And one came back to say thank you. Because we are all in this together. Jesus fed the multitude. That represents all of us. With two fish and five bottle loaves. Because we are all in this together. Jesus went to Calvary. For all of us. Jesus' hands were nailed.
discipleship. Now is the time, yes, and this is the place, even by way of social media, I offer the invitation to discipleship. The doors to my Father's house are open. Won't you give your life to Jesus? Now is the time. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father in heaven, you shall be saved. If you make that confession today, if you make that confession to a believer, the record is you shall be saved. I pray that you make that confession, and I pray that the Lord cover you now, keep, protect, and surround you within his care of love and protection. I thank God for you. I thank God that God orders your steps from this day forward. God bless you. God keep you. In Jesus' name. church that's open in the name of Jesus. We want to lift up households today. We're lifting up families. We're lifting up seasoned saints. We're lifting up our young people, our 2020 graduates. We want to thank God for them and ask God to bless them real good as they're enduring uh, through this crisis. Uh, we want to lift up all of our sick and shut in as you see them scrolling their names scroll across the screen. Deacon Mario Green is coming now, and she's going to render the altar prayer. I thank God for her. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come now before your throne of grace. First of all, Lord, just to say thank you. To thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for being God all by yourself. We thank you, Lord, that you touched us with your finger of love this morning and allowed us to wake up, Lord, clothe in our right mind, purple our heads, Father, remnants of food in our stomach, clothes on our back. And Lord, we can go on and on with the blessings that you gave to us. And we thank you for it, Lord. We know it was because we've been so good, but because of your mercy and your grace. And we just give you the glory, Lord, to give you the honor, to give you the praise. We just thank you. Lord, this morning we just ask that you create in each of us a clean heart and renew in each of us a right spirit. Lord, that you fill us up from your torn down, that you strengthen us where we are weak, that you empty us of our flesh and fill us with your precious Holy Spirit. Father, not our Father, as only you can. Father, 
Father God, we just ask that you just meet with us, Lord. Just lead us, guide us, and direct us, and protect us. Father, we pray not only for our loved ones and our family members and our church members, but we pray for the city and we pray for the state and we pray for our world, Father God. Lord, we're in a world pandemic, Father God, and Lord, only you, Father God, are our source, Lord. And we are needed and dependent upon you. We pray, Father God, for our scientists who are trying to find a, a, a vaccine, Lord, but that will take care of this pandemic, Lord. Lord, just have mercy upon each and every one of us. We need you, Lord, and we just acknowledge you that you are our source. And Father God, as we prepare to leave this place, but never from your presence, we ask that you go with us and you stand by us. And we will forever give you the glory, give you the honor, and give you the praise. For it is in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. The devil is a liar, and we're not going to give him this victory because he would love to see church doors closed and churches financially have to fold. We're not going to let that happen here at Christ Baptist Church. God's church is not empty. God's church is the glory. So you can see across the screen there the many various ways that you can donate to Christ Baptist Church. There are so many ways to donate. Mail, you can use your sale account, you can visit our website, you can come by the church. Our security is here and, and our deacons and trustees are here. And so you see there on the screen the many ways that you can donate and bring your offerings and send in the tithes and the list. God bless you. And I thank you in advance for being so good. God bless you. Rule and abide. 